Welcome back, everybody, for the second installment here on Uncle John and his Paleo Hebrew script myth. Um, if you're just now joining us, if this is where you've arrived, is in the second installment, I strongly encourage you to go back and watch the first video in this series, in this three-part series. Um, I'll put the link in the des I'll put the link in the description below. But um, I encourage you to start there first. And then the second, and then of course the third, um, to get what's going on here, um, where I go a little more in depth on what this actually is. Um, I've never met this individual here, but um, he's got an interesting theory. I know a little bit about the theory, of course. Um, we found out he would be an incredible Scrabble player. I definitely want this guy on my team just for the words that he finds in the prepositional phrase, Burashith. It is crazy how many words he found in that prepositional phrase. Crazy. But anyway, without further ado, we will continue the second installment now. Let's, let's start with a clean Burashith. Uh, the word uh, from Psalm 68, 29 says, because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings will bring you gifts. The word for gift in Hebrew is shy. It's a shin yod. Well, I have a shin yod next to each other uh, on the fourth and fifth letters of Bereshit. Um, so shy is gift. We remember Aleph, the letter Aleph represented the head of the ox, strength. It was God's letter. So before this word shy, I have an Aleph. I have God, God's gift. And up front, I have the word bar. Bar is son. So we have the son of God's gift. And then it's a tav. And tav, remember, represented the cross. So we have the son of God's gift is the cross. Hint, hint. All right, let's, let's look at another approach. Let's start with a clean bearer sheet. Um, Notice the first three letters of Bereshit spell bara. Mm -hmm. Bara also happens to be the second word of the Bible. Bereshit, bara, Elohim. So he's, he's repeating correct. himself the first three letters of the first word with the second word. And bara means to create out of nothing. Ex nilo. Actually. <laughs> There's debate about this, um, whether it's creation from nothing or it's creation out of existing materials here in Genesis 1-1, simply based on that prepositional phrase, Bereshith. There are some scholars who advocate that that phrase should be translated when God began to create. Bereshith bara Elohim. Vet hashimayim vet haaretz. That's how verse 1 says. So by, by changing it, or at least it would seem to be more accurate, a more accurate translation here to say when God began to create the heavens and the earth were unproductive and a wasteland rather than a void and deep. Or a void, sorry, getting my Hebrew mixed up. So, but that would mean that Genesis 1-1 becomes a subordinate or dependent clause on Genesis 2, that following verse. So, um, just to reiterate that verse 1 seems to be dependent on verse 2 there, according to certain scholars, Hebrew scholars, Hebraists, um, me being one of them. So, who is nowhere near their level of professionalism and knowledge, of course. So, um, I just wanted to get that out there. Okay, and in the Latin, I think it is. Um, so, you're creating from nothing, and only God bara in the Bible. Okay. Um, and you know, there's something different. A uh, quick note here. He is absolutely correct. Only God is the one who baraz. It's never a human that baraz. We usually, it's, uh, it's, it's asa or yatsa in the Hebrew for man, for humanity, um, or humankind um, is a more accurate fitting term today. So about God's creation. One, God just speaks it into existence and it comes out of nothing. And it, the creation that he creates is dependent on him being, being. 
okay? Um, if I make, uh, here, here's a shoe made out of thatched. I got it in New Guinea, I think. Um, anyway, but this shoe was made by somebody. And that somebody may not be alive, but the shoe remains after the creator's death. God's creation is not that way. God's creation is dependent on God's existence. Okay? Keep that in mind. He's absolutely correct here. I will commend him for this. He's absolutely correct on his theology, though. Um, creation is certainly dependent, absolutely dependent on the existence of God. Absolutely. So, um, he is spot on here, to be honest. Uh... But that word bara, remember Bereshit, bara, Elohim. Uh, let's look at it. Bara, the bet resh we know is bar, son. And the aleph represents God. So we have son of God mentioned, hinted at, in the first word, first three letters, and in the second word. And it's, it's associating the son of God with the creation as the creator, I'm even thinking, okay? And those first three letters, Bet, Resh, Aleph, Bet is the first letter of Ben, which is son, as is Bar also, but Ben is also a word for son. You've heard it in uh, David Ben-Gurion, uh, David, son of Gurion, the first president of Israel. Uh, in Arabic, you hear it in like Osama bin Laden, that bin is son of. So, Ben is son, Resh is the first letter of Ruach, Ruach is the Holy Spirit, Spirit. No, Ruach does mean, it means, it does mean Spirit, but it does mean Holy Spirit. Ruach means Spirit, Breath, or Wind, okay? To say Holy Spirit in Hebrew would be Ruach or Haruach, depending on if you want to say the Holy Spirit or not, you would put the definite article in front of Ruach. So it would be Ruach Kadosh. Ruach Kadosh. Holy Spirit. Not simply Ruach. That just means spirit, breath, or wind. And Av, Father, uh, begins with the Aleph. So it also hints at the complex unity, the three-in-one nature of God. Uh, and he repeated it first and second word. So you really can't it's miss an it. Odd name okay. for the Trinity. So there's Barah, and then you have He created, and then Shai is a gift, and then Tav is the cross. He created a gift, the cross. <laughs> Who's that again? The cross did not exist as we know it until the ancient Persians. So the writers of Genesis would not have known. By the way, the cross or the tav there meant gate or door. It didn't mean cross. So again, he's he's just simply wrong there with the meaning of tav. Um, just because it looks like a cross doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. Um, it's interesting how many words he can find in this prepositional phrase, b-reshith. It's interesting how many, um, how many um, words he can find in this. Uh, you guys, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are, ever watched King of the Hill. And Peggy, Hank Hill's wife, <laughs> played Scrabble, at least in the first season or so. I think she actually played Scrabble throughout the whole series. But um, it's interesting that she was a phenomenal Scrabble player. Or Boggle. It might have been Boggle or Scrabble. might have been Boggle, now I'm thinking about it. Yes. It was Boggle. This is what this reminds me of. She can find, she found so many words in that little area. That's what this guy reminds me of. So, um, <laughs> sorry for that correlation there, but that's what it just sort of reminds me of. Okay, let's start with a clean barrel sheet. Ah, look at the first four letters. The first four letters spell brosh, bet, resh, aleph, shin. And brosh is a type of tree in Israel. It's a cypress or a pine tree. Mm -hmm. Okay, not just, it's not the general term for tree. It's a specific kind of tree. 
Um, and Yod, remember, Yod was a hand, right? So once you have brosh is a tree, and then you have yod, which is a hand. And yod also can stand for yod hey vav hey Yahweh, right? He chose that teeny tiny letter to represent, to begin his name. So yod oftentimes, on all his names he begins with a yod, right? Yahweh, Yeshua, Yerushalayim, Israel. Yerushalayim is the name of the city of Jerusalem. He's correct that in the word Yerushalayim, the Yod begins the word. But the word itself, Yerushalayim, and the city itself existed before the Old Testament was even was ever written or conceived. So he's sort of anachronistic here, in that Jerusalem existed um, probably in the early Bronze Age, and we have evidence of this in the Armano letters, at least, that Jerusalem existed before the, the writers penned Genesis. So, um, he's sort of being anachronistic here. Yeah. Then you have a Tav. Remember, Tav was a covenant, or the cross. And so we have a Tav on the end. Well, that's an interesting way to break up Bereshit. Um, and by the way, you know, does anyone know what kind of wood they used for the cross? There's no biblical or historical documents that, that state what kind, okay? I don't think it matters. I will tell you this. According to Eastern Orthodox Church tradition, they said that the cross uh, was made of three types of wood. Cedar, pine, and cypress. How do they know this? Or is it a combination, or is it one of the three? Nobody knows. This is the tradition that is a non-biblical source. It is kind of interesting. And why it's interesting that they think that? Because the word brosh is a cypress or a pine tree, and that uh, the, cro the cross material, they think, might be a cedar or a pine or cypress. So there's a crossover with their tradition with the word brosh. Interesting there. Um, now, that yod in the middle is hand, and bro- What was the significance of that? You just said it was non-biblical. He just said it was non-biblical. Just said it was non-biblical. Why? Why? Why on earth would you mention that when it has no relevance or significance to the cross or your argument here? Brosh, remember, can be a tree, and Tav is actually made of wood. That cross is made of wood. It also is a tree. So we really have two trees here with a hand in the middle. Let's look at the first tree. In Genesis 3, 6, uh, it says, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eyes, and that it was desirous for obtaining wisdom, she took the fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Ah, the fall of man. So we have Eve, Chava, her hand, is reaching out and touching a tree which is forbidden okay the reaching out just so you know the touching of a tree is not forbidden it was a certain tree in the garden that was forbidden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that's it they could touch trees they could touch the fruit of other trees just that particular tree out is not forbidden the touching even isn't forbidden, but she is in the process of sinning. Her mind is made up. She's going after this fruit, okay? So putting a hand on the tree is this first sin, and we kind of see it. Or kind of see it. It's right there in your face. you got a hand, yod, and you got a brooch, a tree, okay? 
So how do you remedy this sin problem that this hand reached for this tree? Well, it's... Look at... One interesting thing here before he continues is that Eva, or Eva, Eve, depending on Eva, my German came to mind, sorry. Eve in English, Chava, isn't even in the word. The, the hey there isn't even in the word. Bereshit. So I find that kind of odd that he would just sort of insert Eve there. Look at Luke 23, 33. When they came to the place called the Skull, Golgotha, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and one on the left. Crucify means to nail to a cross. Crucify, crossify. Okay, you're nailing your hand on a cross. Okay, I'm going to pause him uh, here because so we... I'm not so sure if he's got the right Greek word for that. So I'm going to, we're going to look this up here. Um, what was that? Luke 23.33? Um, this is just for me. Um, my Hebrew is better than my Greek. That's why. But, um... Let's see here. Kai Hotilthon Epiton Topon Ton Kaluminon Kainion Eke Estaurus. And here's the word, I think. Ah, yes. So Stauroo, Stauroo, or Stauroo, depending on if you roll your R on the front or the back, um, is to fasten to a cross or crucify. To destroy, a second definition is to destroy through connection with the crucifixion of Christ or crucify. Um, it doesn't mean crossify. <laughs> it, it just means crucify. It's just you crucify someone. That is, you fasten to a cross. He's got that portion right, according to the BDAC here, which is the standard for Greek, uh, New Testament Greek, and Septuagint Greek, um, although there are other uh, lexicons that scholars use for other than the BDAG. But that's all it means is to fasten to a cross, crucify. It doesn't mean crossify. So, just, yeah, just throwing that out there. So, anyway, we digress. Yeah, how, do you, how do you remedy Eve's hand on the tree? by Christ, Messiah, Yeshua. He puts his hand on a tree and has it nailed to a tree. He becomes that sacrifice. This is such okay. a far stretch to reach. And by yeah. the way, I have to comment, what is up with the... Are those fake flowers? Those seem to be fake flowers. I just, I was just distracted by those flowers, that's all. Beautiful, anyway. brilliant, brilliant. And look at... Yahweh's name. God's name is Yahweh. Yud Hey Vav Hey. Yod is the Hebrew word for hand. Hey is Hey. Wow, a revelation. Vav is a nail. Hey, a revelation. To express revelation or to reveal in the Hebrew is Gala. Gala. It is a third Hey verb. Aramaic, it is the same. It's the same word in Aramaic, Biblical Aramaic. Again, he reverts back to these pictographic, um, these pictographs that existed hundreds of years before the Hebrew script, even the Paleo-Hebrew script, even the Hebrew language came into existence, which was in the 10th or 9th century. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous. If you put them together, the hand reveals, the nail reveals. Who's this? It's a painting. All right, let's look at let's let's look at a clean bear sheet again. Oh dear! Again, Boggle or Scrabble come to mind every time. Ah, raspberry juice and water is today's drink. Uh, okay, clean bear sheet. Notice the That's two nasty. middle letters is Aleph Shin. Aleph is strength, 
right? Head of the ox. Uh, shin is destruction. It was two teeth. Okay, so we have no. this word. No, sheen or shane means tooth. Nothing more. Nothing more. In the middle, H. It's strong. Called it. Called it. I knew it. I knew he would go here with H. Oh. Destruction. Sorry, I was what is a strong excited destruction? There. What destroys everything? Ash. Fire. That's the Hebrew word for fire. We get the word ash comes from ash. God. Not only is he he's great at Scrabble and Boggle, or he would be, but he's not so good at linguistics. Not so good at linguistics. Hebrew was always first. Okay? So, we have the word fire in the middle of Bereshit. Well, let's take word. that fire up in the middle, and let's look at the four letters that surround it. Uh, it's Don't a bet, resh, yod, tav. Well, there's a Hebrew word. It's the word brit. Brit is covenant. Brit. An agreement. Uh, or a testament. Means, brit means um, covenant or agreement or alliance. That's what it means here. Um, I'll bring this up to, to, uh, to show you guys. Um, so if we... Uh, let's go through here. We're going to go to here. So it's bait. It's bait. Um, reish. And then I've lost my... There it is. So we're going to go down here to bait. Reish. And Tav. Uh, here we go. Uh, is this it? This might be it here. Berith. Nope, nope, that's salt. Sorry. Um, if I can find it here, hopefully. Um, Anyway, um, I'm not gonna. I'm not, I'll spare you the uh, looking it up, but um, berit means covenant alliance. So he's got that right right now. But okay. We'll go Maybe on. you've heard of the Brit Hadashah, the new covenant. Jeremiah thirty one thirty one tells the Jews, "I'm going to give you a Brit Hadashah, a new covenant, but not like the one at Sinai that you broke. A new covenant, a new testament." Yes. So, my Jewish friends, you should be looking for a New Testament. Okay, um, so there's a breed. And what it, the actual definition of a breed was whenever it, it involved the cutting, right? Uh, you, you know, when a, a baby is circumcised at day eight, that's a breed. There's a cutting of the, the foreskin, okay? A breed has, has some cutting involved. And we see it first, back in Genesis 15, starting in verse 8. Um, this is when uh, God makes all these promises to Abram, and uh, starting in verse 8. But Abram replied, Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, how can I know I will possess it? And Yahweh said to him, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brought all these to him, split each of them down the middle, and laid the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. And the birds of prey descended on the carcasses, but Abram drove them away. And as the sun was setting, Abram fell into a deep sleep, and suddenly great terror and darkness overwhelmed him. From verse 13 to 16, God's going to do some prophesying of what's going to happen to his descendants. Then we jump to verse 17. It said, When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch appeared and passed between the halves of the carcasses. On that day, the Lord made a breach, a covenant, Be with Abram, saying, 
To Betty. your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, and the land of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different groups. Okay, so we see that's Breet, a cutting of half with animals. And the idea was you would walk between these animals that were cut in half, and you've made this deal. Uh, I promise to do this if you promise to do that. And if either one of us break our promise, may we end up like these animals cut in half. That was the picture. Oh. Well, here, this is an unconditional... Holy smokes, did he get that right. That's exactly what was going on. It also alludes to A&E um, covenants at the time as well. They would, um, they would do the same thing. So it's not just limited to Abraham here. Uh, it was uh, in the ancient Near East too, if I'm not mistaken. Additional covenant. Uh, Abram was put to sleep and God walked between the, the pieces as a flaming torch or a flaming oven. Okay, so that's what you have here in this word Bereshit. We have an ash, a fire, in the middle of a breed. And that word Breet, by reasoning. the way, notice, it's the first two letters is Bet Resh. That's Bar, Sun. Then you have a Yod, Hand. Then you have a Tav, Cross. <laughs> Hidden in the word Breet is the Sun with his hand on the cross. Oh, my Lord. Wow, that's kind of the ultimate, not kind of, that's the ultimate Breet. Hand reveals, nail reveals. His intellect is dizzying. Oh my word. But we see in that word breed, we have the ash, the fire. It's the Abrahamic covenant is for being foretold in that first word. And that Abrahamic covenant, that's huge. This is where... Okay, I have to stop him here. Yes, Genesis 15 says that. It uses the word berith, berith, which means covenant, alliance, anything like that. But I'm sh I'm surprised he didn't he didn't go into the New Testament here, where someone comes to baptize with fire and water, with fire. Fire is the key word. The Greek word there is pur, but um, it doesn't fit his purposes here. That's why he doesn't use it unless he uses Septuagint. Uh, <laughs> but uh, my guess is he probably favors the hero for the Greek any day of the week. Ha <laughs> ha, that rhyme there is free of charge for you guys. Um, but what I'm trying to get at is that the word berit is used throughout the New Testament. The Mosaic Covenant, guess what words used there? Berit. <laughs> I honestly think, um, let me see here, let's go to Genesis 12 here. Um, I'm going to go to Genesis 12, see if the word is used in Genesis 12, because I thought it was. Beginning here in verse 3, we've got Avra, Av, Avarka, Me, Vara, Me, Me, Varkekra, Um, Kalelka, Aor, Venevreku, Vuka, Kol, Mishpahothra, Adama, Vayelek, Avram, Kasher, Tiber, Elav, Yahweh, Vayelek, Ito, Lot, the Avram ben Hamesh, Shanim, the Shivim, Shana, Betseto, Meharan. So what's going on here is God's calling Abraham out of Ur, um, or Ur Kesh. Some people think it's Ur in southeastern Mesopotamia. I don't think so. I think it's more closer to Haran. But there's some debate about that. But that's what's going on here. Um, so he takes Sarai and his son Lot, and they go to Haran. So that's what's going on. Um, I really thought that um, it would have had the word berit in here. If I can look it up, maybe I'll be 0 for 2 today looking up things I'd like to look up here. Um, <laughs> your seed, uh, the land, this land. I will build your name or I will build an altar there. Levet el ha'ai. I could have sworn he used the word berit here. No? 
Uh, talk. Famine in the land. Okay, um, I won't bore you with details here. I thought it was. I can't. It's inconclusive. Shall we say? We'll call that inconclusive. It says, Abraham believed, this is 15.6, Genesis 15.6, Abraham believed God, and God credited to him his righteousness. That's how you get to heaven, by faith. Yes. It has nothing to do with works. Abraham was put to sleep. He had no say in this breed. Abraham just believed. Very nice. Okay, let's look at Bereshit from a different angle. Uh, let's get a clean Bereshit here. Again, different um, angle. Notice... This is interesting how he restarts it over and over and over, coming up with new words here. It, it's... Mm, mm, mm. I, I really don't have an explanation for this. Um, but... How many meanings is this guy going to find out here? That the letters he chose for Bereshit, he chose the Aleph and the Bet, which are the first two letters. He also... He, wait, wait. I hope he's not going to do what I think he's going to do. He's going to go through the alphabet here and find meanings for each one that reveal Jesus Christ in the first word or in the first verse. Is he going to reveal... No. So chose no. a yod, which is kind of a middle letter, and it's the, Av, that the word father his name. Av. And he chose the last three letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Wow, that's kind of interesting. You no, know, it's he, not. Some of the beginning, the middle, and the end. So that word. They're just. He's just. They're just using words in their language. They're using letters to form words in their language in order to form clauses, sentences, complete thoughts. That's all they're doing. Bereshit, it kind of encapsulates the entire word of God, right? In English, if we say, uh, he knows that all from A to Z. A to Z, it's the beginning Zed. and the end. It's the, it, it captures the whole alphabet, the whole language, right? In the Greek, from the Alpha to the Omega, the beginning to the end, the first and the last. Yes! It, when you name the first and last of an alphabet, and that's what he's doing here. He's got the first two, the last three, and one in the middle. He's no! Out, this is it. This is the whole word no. of God here. Okay? That's not what he's doing. He's showing up in this verse. No. Very nice. Disappointing. And in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the New Testament, oh, dear it Lord. says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's in Because John is saying that Jesus Christ is the Logos. He's the second person of the Trinity. That's what the whole prologue is about. It's revealing the divinity of the second person of the Trinity, namely, Jesus Christ. Interesting. This is the only other verse in the Bible that starts in the beginning. Yes. And it's, it's a theological reference to Genesis 1 1, which I'm sure you're going to tell us here in a few seconds. It says, In the beginning was the Word. And here in the first in the beginning, in beginning Bereshit, we have the whole Word encapsulated there. Okay? Mm -mm, not in Genesis 1 1. Nice. No, you don't. John 1, 14 goes on to say, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we Sorry. saw His glory. Glory is of the only Look begotten so. from the Father, full of grace and truth. Hmm. wonder who that could be. Hmm. Hmm. Okay, let's, let's start with a clean bear of sheep. Um, I, that notice, one made no sense to me. I, there is a connection between John 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 1, in that he's tying Jesus to the beginning of creation. That's what the prologue is about. He's tying Jesus to the, that Jesus was there in the beginning. That's all that's going on there. Again, John is revealing or explaining, exegeting is one of the words actually in the prologue there, that Jesus was there at the beginning of creation because he's the second person of the Trinity. Holy smokes, bro. That's it. There's an Aleph and a Tav. We'll in that later. last uh, 
we were talking about the first and the last, right? The Alpha and the Omega. In Hebrew, the first letter is the Aleph, the last letter is the Tav. And he has here the third and the sixth letters for the Aleph and the Tav. And what's famous about the Aleph and the Tav? Well, they are the first, as I said, the first and the last of the Hebrew alphabet, okay? Which is kind of interesting. Um, in, in Isaiah three times, Yahweh says, I am the first and I am the last. And in the New Testament, three times, Yeshua Jesus said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. If you take that Aleph and the Tav, notice in Genesis 1.1, Aleph Tav is a word. It's the word et, and it shows up as the fourth word in the verse. Bereshit, bara, Elohim, et. And notice where et sits in the sentence. It sits at the right hand of Elohim. Hmm. Oh, my word. I cannot begin to understand the direction he's going to take this one. But, um, okay. Um, we're, we're about to find out, though, aren't we? Um, okay, so two things about the word it. it. One, it's a preposition meaning it, with. It is, eight. Um, two, it's a directional particle. Or it's a direct, I'm sorry, a direct object marker. Et here is a direct object marker. That's all it serves there. It's a direct object marker, so you don't confuse the subject with the direct object. That's all it is. That's why in the next phrase, uh, the words coming up is et chashemayim, the et haaretz, okay? And that the et there before each word is to let you know that the word for heaven Shemayim and Aretz or Haaretz, they're both direct objects. They are receiving the action. That's all that it is. That's all it is. I remember uh, Hebrews 10 12 says, but when this priest, Yeshua, had offered all time. Uh, one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. So here we have the Aleph Tav sitting at the right hand of Elohim. And it is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And if we look at the Hebrew uh, pictographs, Aleph is the head of the ox. Tav. Oh, notice we've changed the definition here from cross to sticks is crossed sticks. Wait a minute, an ox on crossed sticks. This is a picture of a sacrifice, right? You have the burnt offering, you bring the bull. <laughs> oh, 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 that's precious. Cross sticks. Hold on. Oh. Not today. Not today. Okay. Oh, and you kill it and you put it on the wood and you burn it all up. That's a picture of the burnt offering. No. We also know what is Aleph You're wrong. also. Aleph is strength. Aleph is God's letter. And Tav, beside cross sticks, is a picture of the cross. So you have God on the cross. When do we ever see God on a cross? All right. Okay, let's go another slant. Uh, give me a clean bear sheet. All right, guys. I think here we'll stop. Um, we'll stop for the second installment here. Um, I'm sorry. Cross sticks had me in stitches. Um... <laughs> what a way to conclude, right? So next week, we will conclude this three-part series on the Paleo-Hebrew script myth with our friend Uncle John here. Um, I'll put a link in the description for the original video again. And again, if you like this sort of content, please hit the like button and subscribe. And I will see you guys in the next video.